Hi, Elizabeth. to still be able to get in the water here in the Bay Area. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> it's a little chilly in New York right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there are some brave souls who are uh, still always, in. Right? I don't know. <laughs> the, ice. <laughs> the ice swimming. Yeah, ice swimming. I know that um, when I when I was researching the book, um, there was I think the ice swimming, the International Ice Swimming Federation had recorded something like, I don't know, 250 or so documented ice swims, which is, I think you had to, wow. it had to be like 41 degree water or less for, you know, a certain period of time. And uh -huh. now I bet that it's like, because people have not, you know, right. have had a lot of time on their hands, <laughs> they've been, you know, racking those up. I actually want to go and check what those numbers are now. It's not, it doesn't include me, is basically what I'm <laughs> There are some amazing stories out there. Yes, very, um, very resilient, very resistant to cold. Yeah, I saw um, Lynn Cox is going to have a talk um, fairly soon. Uh, uh -huh. I'm not sure if she's going to talk about some of her real extreme swimming. I'm not sure what the focus of the talk is, but that'll be interesting because she's amazing as well. I love listening to her talk about what it's like to swim in all those places, to swim in Antarctica, to swim in mm -hmm. you know the Bering Strait. And she, um, she's so funny because she she's very not excited when she she's so calm. She's got such just calm, calm, soothing voice. And you'll ask her about you know facing down. I don't know, like biting, stinging things, or, you know, in South Africa, I think she was saying that the, the breakers, um, the waves kept throwing her back on the beach and she mm. just kept going back out, but she just goes in and she just has, has this very soft and huh. soothing voice. And she talks about it like a radio host. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we'll get started. Uh, let's see. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, what a week it has been. I can't think of a better way than to grab a glass of wine or beverage of choice, uh, the book, Why We Swim, and check into the Zoom with you all this evening. My name is Elizabeth Yuen, representing the Asian American Journalist Association's New York chapter, as well as at large, which comprises AAJA members who mostly don't live near a geographic chapter. Um, AAJA was founded in Los Angeles 40 years ago this year, thanks to a small group of journalists at KMBC TV, the Los Angeles Times, and the Japanese American newspaper Rafu Shimpo. Uh, the organization has grown to some 20 chapters across the United States, as well as in Asia. Um, we have about 1,700 members, nearly a third of whom are students. Uh, AAJA provides support for Asian American and Pacific Islander journalists and those aspiring to enter the news business with networking, job resources, scholarship assistance, and mentoring at each stage of one's career. Uh, AAJA also offers an awareness of news media and fair access for the AAPI community, and is the eyes and ears for when media outlets go astray in covering the community and its issues. AAJA and its chapters offer workshops and free events, uh, which are free to produce. So if you like this event, uh, want to see more, and are in a position to do so, please consider a donation which will go towards supporting scholarships, grants, and making an impact. Uh, by the way, we'll soon announce a book club with Charles Yu, uh, the National Book Award winner for his novel, Interior Chinatown. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And now to tonight's event. Um, some housekeeping, um, please feel free to interact via the chat. And during the Q&A, we'll ask if you can re raise your hand. Uh, you can do so by going to participants and find the raise hand function and you'll be called upon. Um, this will be in the final half hour. Um, you can also choose between um, speaker view or gallery view, depending on um, what's your preference. Um, I also I, I want to thank Bonnie Tui and Amy Wu um, for uh, being being here and in all of you. Um, Bonnie Tui is a journalist and author of Why We Swim, as well as the forthcoming children's book Sarah and the Big Wave, which comes out in May. Uh, she is based in Berkeley, uh, New York born and a frequent contributor to the New York Times and California Sunday Magazine. 
Bonnie has also appeared in the documentary The Search for General To about the dish we all know and is a recipient of the Corolla Cycle Crave Excellence in Food Journalism Fellowship by the San Francisco chapter of Les Dames d'Escoffier. I want to thank Algonquin Books, which has given us a 30% promo code for Why We Swim for this event. Uh, we also have as moderator, Amy Wu, a journalist and swimmer and founder of From Farms to, Cu to Incubators, uh, which highlights stories of women innovators in agriculture. Her new book of that name will be our book club choice for May. Last year, Worth Magazine named her to its groundbreakers list of 50 women changing the world. I'm really excited about tonight's discussion. And with that, I toss it to you, Amy. Well, thank you, Liz, for that excellent introduction. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real honor uh, to be here. And thank you to the uh, team at AAJA um, New York tonight for making this event happen. Um, so I'm really excited to participate as both a, a journalist and a swimmer, an avid swimmer, passionate swimmer tonight. Um, so no pun intended, but let's jump right in. <laughs> Um, Bonnie, let me start by saying that I, I really enjoyed reading, uh, reading the book as both a reader and um, I can say a swimming fanatic. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I, I wanted to start out by asking you, what inspired you uh, to write this book? Um, one of my answers to that question is I wanted to, there's so many books about running for runners and I hate running. <laughs> And I wanted a book uh, for swimmers. I mean, and, and in all seriousness, I, I, I think that, um, you know, there are books um, that are memoirs and there are books that are um, about the, you know, technique of swimming and a little bit of history. But I, I wanted something that was a little bit more expansive, you know, that was, I always go back to um, Chris McDougall's Born to Run, which I think was just such a, a wonderful, like, genre smashing um uh, book that had this wonderful narrative, um, but there were braided narratives um, and stories of um, the Taramora Indian runners and also about this race, but also about his own relationship to running and running through injury and, and, and wanting to do it better. Um, and, you know, the drama of that and all the people who participate in this race. And I, I love that it was just a good yarn, you know, and, and I wanted to do something like that for swimming because I hadn't seen that before. And, um, of course, I grew up a swimmer. My parents met in a Hong Kong swimming pool. My dad was a lifeguard and my mom was, you know, just this great swimmer. And we grew up in New York at Jones Beach in the pool swim team. Um, and... Uh, I've had a lifelong relationship with swimming that's changed over time, like through being a lifeguard, through swim team, through, uh, you know, trying open water swims and exploration and travel and, and then kind of coming back to um, understanding that it's a constant, even though it changed for me. And so that sort of personal story holds, the, uh, I think is a little bit of the frame, I guess I'm a little bit of the frame for the book, but that you know, the stories that I'm holding within that are the stories of the great swimmers, like we were talking about earlier, um, you know, when we were waiting for this event to start, like Lynn, Lynn Cox and, mm. um, you know, and these amazing stories of survival and these uh, just, those stories are, are bigger um, than themselves, you know, and so they lend themselves thematically to the different ways that we can answer the question of why we swim, um, which is how the book is organized. And so um, first and foremost, of course, survival, then, um, you know, once you can, you can survive the water, then it could become something more. And then it's for well-being and it's for community and, and um, competition and flow. And so I, I um, once I figured out that structure, it was really, I mean, so easy to write this book. It was, which is, but it took me, a million years to figure out the structure. So I think that that yeah. front loading thinking was um, was really important in this case. So I, I, I really love the word, one of the words you brought up just now, braided. And and I want to take a step back. And I, I totally agree with you. There are not a lot of swimming books out, out there. So this is it's this is a real um, this is a real treat for us swimmers. I want to talk a little bit about the structure and the organization, um, which um, as as a fellow writer and a swimmer, I was thinking, my gosh, there are a million ways that one could actually cut the cake, quote, you know. Absolutely, yeah. 
so many different angles and framing that one could take with, um, with swimming. So how did you decide upon the organization of, of the book or the outline and the five themes? I'd love to hear more about that. It was really hard. So I would say um, something like five years ago, I started thinking about, okay, maybe I will, you know, I, the, my previous book was American Chinatown. And I thought, um, you know, that was 10 years ago. And I, um, I thought that if I was going to write another book, it might be about swimming. But again, like swimming as a topic, it's not a, um, it's not a story, right? It's not the story. And so how to approach this enormous sprawling topic, the subject, and um, tell stories in a, in a compelling way that, that, that I could do well, right? So uh, it took me a while to think about that. And so I started just collecting, you know, interesting tidbits and stories that people would tell me. And what was so wonderful about the whole process is that when I, when I would tell people that I was thinking about writing a book about swimming, people just had very passionate responses. Mm -hmm. Either they loved it or they hated it, or they, but they always had some story to tell. And so I would just get this really richly, um, um, very vivid, you know, bits and pieces of people's lives and their relationship with water, whether or not they said, I'm a swimmer or I'm not a swimmer, or I'm afraid of the water or I love the water or I have this very you know, I have a very powerful response. And that to me spoke of like the human condition mm. with water, which is that you can die so easily in it, but you have to be taught how to handle yourself in it, right? So that to me, that like tension was super interesting. So that came up as something that a theme of course with survival that w runs through the book. Um, so, you know, I was collecting all of these stories and bits and pieces and I, um, I really did not know how to, it took me a really long time to figure out how to structure it. And I would talk to other writers um, mm. and friends. And finally, I showed the material that I had to a really smart editor friend of mine. And she said, you know, this is great stuff, but why don't you call it something as um, simple and clear as why we swim? Yeah. And then everyone will know what this book is about. And I just was like, ding! And everything, I, it's not, I, I'm not, uh, it, I'm not oversimplifying things by saying that everything that I had already gathered started falling, sifting into these five different top, these, these thematic topics that I mentioned. And, and then, and then we were off to the races. Like then I just knew how to structure it. And again, to, to, to understand that, um, to make these stories accessible, that my story is, is not front and center, but that it is like the frame to hold it together because I, I mm -hmm. feel very strongly about all of these things. And so I could be the person who's like your friend telling you these stories, yeah. you know, throughout the book. So I definitely want to come back to that. Um, I, I love the way that you wove yourself, your own story into the, um, into the book as well. And as I, as, I, as I was reading the book, I was just like, oh my gosh, this book took you, it, it feels like so many different places. Uh -huh. um, I felt like I was on the plane with you <laughs> going to these <laughs> continents. Oh, no, why so did you feel I that would, way? Yeah, you know, so that, that, I'm glad that you felt that so, way. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the research. Like, how did you decide which threads to follow? Um, how many continents and countries and <laughs> did this take you to? <laughs> so many, so many. I mean, I, like I said, I have a lot of, like, you know, cutting room floor material. But um, I did know when I sold the proposal um, what stories, big stories and characters would be anchoring each section. So that was really nice. And so to me, that felt wonderful because when I sold the book, I didn't panic. You know, I, th I feel like when I sold American Chinatown, I started panicking <laughs> because I had never run anything like that before. And so um, I just felt like I knew so much more this time around, which was that I had to make sure that there was something there that I wanted to spend, you know, a couple of years. And then by that point in time, I'd already spent a, a, lot, a lot longer, yeah. but that it, but it makes a difference, right? So um, that, so the stories in, that made it into the book are, you know, very much informed by years and years of, of experience, years and years of travel and, mm. you know, things that I'd written about in some foreign form or another before. And so what was fun about this book was that once I decided to write a book about swimming, I realized that a lot of the stories I'd written over the years that had gotten the most 
um, interest or reader response or whatever were about swimming or were about water or were about um, some facet of that exploration. So that was a really, um, you know, you only know when you look backwards that you see this, um, this unifying theme, um, the sort of thread that runs through some of your work, you know, and of course, before that, it was a lot about um, um, what it is about identity in America, uh, America and about what it is to be an American and, and race mm. and my family's personal history coming to uh, this country through New York and San Francisco's Chinatowns. And so, um, you know, but then a parallel uh, thematic thread is our relationship with the water, like tracing all the way back to Hong Kong. And so that that was very nice, has been a very nice thing to see um, especially this year that that mm. all of those things seem to make sense yeah um, and you know I mean you all know as writers and journalists that um, that is pleasing <laughs> you know it's not always very neat right. like that but it's satisfying to understand that the things that maybe you weren't really aware of mm. um, are happening on a subconscious level so on your on this journey of writing and researching the book, um, were there any like wow or aha moments? Like for example, how did you find the story in like Japan, for example, about like samurai swimming? Just right. fascinated by that, and I had never heard of that actually. I'm you know what I'm trying to think myself now how I came upon that um, because it's been some time since I realized when I. When I, I have to look back on my notes, but I once I did come across the the um, the fact that there is this swimming martial art in Japan that goes back to you know the the feudal period and 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 that all of the samurai clans had their own schools of swimming and their styles and techniques that were geographically mm -hmm. situated I just thought that is amazing and why have I not heard about this why right. and, and and what was interesting was that when I went to Japan to research that my Japanese friends a lot of them didn't know about it either and so they once I asked them about it they would kind of start looking it up or um, finding mm -hmm. things on TV and or they realized then when they started paying attention that um, especially since the Olympics were kind of coming up at the time still coming up hopefully um, mm -hmm. but that that um, the sort of Japanese news media would also start covering this like you know ancestral tradition you know yeah. and, and that they had plans to do a, um, a samurai swimming showcase at the Tokyo Olympics and um, so it was such a thrill to go and research and spend time with the masters who were practicing this art and telling mm. me all about it and understanding that at least in in English that this was something that would be new to people to share in the book you know um, that said a lot of Japanese again don't know about it either so that was also um, a really funny and weird thing but also a gratifying thing to understand that it would be, it was fun to help surface that in, in the modern um, uh, sort of culture. So I, I also, on the same thread, love the way that you wrote about your, your own, your, yourself in that. Like I could see you on the pool deck and you said you were wearing sweats. <laughs> Oh my God, I was sweating. I really wanted to get in the water. I was so torn. And, and all the masters was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah. I have to, I have to take good. that. So it was like the journalist in me or the swimmer, like fighting. Yeah, I could feel that. I could, I was always like, jump in with your notebook. But anyway. And I said, I'll go back. I'll go back and do it. Yeah. So on, on that note, how did you decide to, and this is back to the structure of the book and the writing, decide to weave your story in this as well and I thought you did it so artfully I mean so seamlessly thank you um I, it, that was a very hard thing to do because I at first um wanted it to be more of a straight journalism you know I'm you know classic right that yeah. you're not really you're a narrator but you're you're not subjectively in it um, and then the, and the people who I would show the early readers, I would show some of the pages to kept saying, oh, I want more of you in it. And I would say, and a very, I would resist that, you know, mm. um, 
and I under and I and I saw that I had some pages that were you know more personal, and you know in the book if you've read the book you see that there are um, the sections of the book that are more personal, and then mm. um, I think what what I finally understood was that I and I and and by reading a lot of other nonfiction books that um, did like did this. Um, that you could have a vo you, it could be voicey it could be your voice um that can help bridge the more personal writing with the reporting you know with the storytelling of other people and um but that was hard i mean because i've mostly written in two modes right and and probably most of you have as well where it's like either more personal essay mode or a, you know it's a, a, a reporting journalistic mode that is more distant from the story yeah. but i i do think of course it's changed you know it has changed a lot over the last even more recent few years where journalism is allowed to be and is more powerful because it has yeah. a point of view and you understand the human costs of a lot of the things that these people that journalists are reporting and so i think that's something that i came to understand is um allowed i guess yeah. <laughs> you're allowed to do that i, I really i really love that um i mean the book was very rich with all these different stories and i imagine that you had more stories and in fact you alluded to it at the end that you actually had more stories that just could this did not make the book so i'm just curious as to like if you could talk tell us a little bit about what stories um, didn't make it to the book, but you wished had made it to the book. Maybe it'll be a sequel, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was this, um, this very weird, uh, swimming instruction manual that was written in Latin, um, in England. It's called, um, it's by, it was by Everard Digby. And for people who are, um, very deep into swimming archives, you'll have heard of it. Um, and, and it was called De Arte Natandi. And uh, the, what compelled me so much about this text is the drawings in it. I wish I actually had some mm. of the, had brought some of the photocopies I have, but I was in the archives, you know, of UC Berkeley digging up this a copy of this book. And there are these drawings of, they're like woodcuts of, um, you know, a guy sort of like windmilling in a river <laughs> or like walking into, yeah, this is how you safely enter the water. And I, if I'm like, this is so basic and so weird, but I think what I came to understand, I'm um, actually after talking to some historians about this is that at that time, wait, I'm trying to get, see if I get this right. I think this was in the, I wanna say it was in the 1600s. Don't, don't hold me to that because it's been a while since I've seen this book, um, but that it, uh, people were not swimming. Actually, people did not know how to conduct themselves in water in mm. Europe, and specifically England. So where where this, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, swimming traditions kind of came back, swimming education kind of came back um, in the kind of 1800s um, in England and, and, and was swimming education was something that was taught then in the boarding schools and then there were swimming clubs and then it just was this explosion this renaissance but before that there was like this sort of dead period of like mm -hmm. people were not swimming in yeah. europe but before that you know of course it was like um the greeks the romans um it was like a very much a uh a, a, a martial art that was that was for if you if you you didn't get a good education if you didn't know how to swim yeah. And um, so that whole gap uh, was really interesting to, to learn about. Um, and of course, in the Egyptians, the Chinese, like everybody knew this was Julius Caesar was like supposed to be like a really good swimmer, <laughs> you know, like that was part of this, yeah. you know, being a really good um, soldier. Anyway, uh, the Assyrians, you know, it was on these like, you know, bas relief carvings and um anyway it's it's a fascinating so all of that stuff like i wish i could have gotten really you can really get like deep into this stuff and right. I, I, once i started writing about it i just thought okay is someone going to come with me down this hole this mm -hmm. rabbit hole is going to ruin the whole arc of the you know the flow so to speak 
Um, and so everyone, I think, you know, understands this when you're kind of choosing what to cut and what to keep. But what I did find so gratifying also with the writing of the book is that, and what was so funny was that I kept, like it was around 65, 70,000 words and I would add like 10,000 words and it would balloon out and then it would go. So it always wanted to be at this equilibrium. Um, and so that's kind of fun when you, when you understand that it has finally reached like a life of its own, that it, ha you know, it wants mm -hmm. to be a certain length. And so that's when I kind of knew that I was getting close to the end. Well, so some of the stories that um, I, I myself resonated with as a master's, uh, master mm -hmm. swimmer, fitness swimmer, <laughs> and a bit of an open water swimmer is that you included, um, you know, both fitness yeah. pool swimmers and, um, open water swimmers and cold water swimmers. Just curious, like I want to dig a little bit into the swimming aspect now. Did you notice yeah. any common traits or themes among like open water swimmers versus pool swimmers or? I mean, I think that there's definitely some overlap, but I would say that usually people prefer one or the other, right? And, and they are really different experiences. One of the things that I've really thought about is um, your attention is, is different in, in open water versus a pool. And that is, uh, I think, just by virtue of having to be more wary and aware of the dangers when you're open water swimming in the, in the ocean or in, in, I mean, like in a lake, I mean, maybe you have to f watch out for speedboats, but that, you know, that happens, you know, boats are really coming at a fast clip. Um, but that you are, you know, you, you are noticing a lot of so much more like externally, because you're, you're con constantly scanning the environment. Um, so in that way, I think it feels very primal. Um, so that you're very present. And I think pool swimming, which I love, um, mm. I actually really love pools, uh, that it's more internal, it's, it's like in your, you're more in your head, because you can take the environment for granted. It's a very known circumscribed space um and so you're kind of on autopilot and your body knows what to do you know, it knows where to do the flip turns and where to um you know where like how many strokes to wherever and so i think then it's more of this like wonderful um uh internal conversation with yourself but that i that i really like and i and i'm thinking about it fresh now because i i was fortunate enough to get a lap uh, a lane reservation this morning at the at my pool, and um, it had been a couple weeks since I'd been in there. And just to slide in and then just you know have it just wash over me and um, have that hush for you know forty five minutes was really was really great. And um, you know it's comfortable. And and when you're in open water, it's not necessarily so. And I think that's the real. Um, uh, I don't know if that means, I'm not saying that pool swimmers are more soft than open water swimmers, but <laughs> there's usually like a temperature preference in yeah. the populations. Um, but that I think that when you're seeking um, open water and, and all of its forms, uh, that's, a, that's a certain kind of uh, exploration that I think is different from pool swimmers. It's interesting, some of the folks that um, you profiled in the book, like um, Lynn Cox, for example, and, um, you know, I, as an open water swimmer myself, I read about these folks, and um, I think another one is Katie Ledecky, you know, who mm -hmm. is an Olympic champion, and Dara Torres. I'm just wondering, um, were there any points in your interview or your research with them that it was like, oh, wow, that was really interesting. Any kind of things that really popped out um, that surprised you when you were able to talk to them or meet them? Um, I would say with the swimmers like Lynn Cox or, um, I mean, or Dara Torres or um, Lewis Pugh, who's um, the swimmer, uh, the swimmer who has swum across the North Pole. <laughs> Again, very extreme um, environments, they're very motivated. They are driven to the point, you know, Diana and Naya, like just that mm. there's like, um, I, I think that their, uh, their mindset, they're very steely, you know, in a certain way. And they have a very strong sense of, 
what they want to do and accomplish. Um, and their motivation is interesting to me because they would talk about why they did the swims in, in different ways. So like Lewis Pugh is like, I'm swimming to call attention to climate change. And, you know, you should never be able to swim across the North Pole. You know, that shouldn't be the case that it's melted. It should always be frozen and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, he also acknowledges that he is an extremely competitive person. Like, you know, he was a lawyer before that. And so, um, you know, he may be saying that he's doing it for these like big lofty goals, but really when it comes down to it, he wants to know if he can do it. You know, he's super driven. And I kind of poked at that a little bit. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I'm very competitive, but I'm competitive <laughs> like, with myself, you know, because you just said uh, like, uh, or that Lynn Cox, I remember, oh, she did not want, she, um, you know, she had done all these epic swims, these amazing achievements where she'd swim, swim across the Bering Strait to, you know, really like call attention to geopolitical um, relations and wanting to bridge that in some way with her swims. But also she's, she is incredible. Like she is, she has this like steely internal, um, you know, force that's driving her to do these things, even though she's like, I'm not competitive, I'm not competing with anyone else, but I think she's competing with herself in a very mm -hmm. real way. Um, you know, I think because she's been sort of standing alone in what she does for so long. And, and, and I do think that there's something to that. Um, you know, and of course, um, Dara Torres, you know, being this five Olympic Olympian, uh, not consecutive, you know, that, that she's just, she, she, um, she had to have something really powerful pushing her to come back every single time again and again and again. And then being said, you're the oldest, you're called a grandma. And then the last one, she was 41. I mean, but she was, you know, a teenager when she went to her first Olympics that she would say, you know, we were talking on the phone once and she was driving her car and she's just like, hold on. And then she's like, you know, beep, I hear horns blaring. And she's like, I just need to get through the intersection. I want to beat this person around the turn. And she would say that when she was a kid, uh, you know, they would run to the car, like she and her siblings, see who would get there first or would call, who would be the first to call their mom on Mother's Day, like just all of the, everything was a contest. And that's something that they, she obviously gets satisfaction from that external motivation of like other people. Um, now I should say that I am not a person with swimming who anymore is motivated by competition. <laughs> I love just, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm old now, but I love just cruising. No, I, I like to go, f I mean, I was a sprinter. I, I still am a sprinter, but I, I now I just like to cruise. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I feel like doing my laps or swimming for distance instead of time, um, or at least like not quite on a clock or not having a coach barking at me, that that, that feels satisfying too. Because when, you're, when you learn on a, to swim and you and it's in a competitive setting with the swim team like it's a very regimented thing it's a thing that you you know it's uh it's a very specific way of being with the water and relating to um the sport and i feel really happy that i've had the experience of doing that but i also feel equally happy that i've been able to understand that it's beneficial to me in a lot of other different ways mm. especially now well, since we're on the topic, um, a lot of age group swimmers uh, burn out after yeah. maybe two workouts a day. One really, you know, they never see light. You know, you wake up in the yeah, dark. I know. Yeah. It's always dark. Um, and clearly in this book, your passion for swimming and the water comes out with every page. So what would you say kept you passionate about swimming and the sport and um, so when I went to college, I was tired of competitive swimming. I'd been doing it for, you know, ten, at least 10 years at that point. And I, wa I wanted college to be the thing that, or the place that I got to do new things, right? So then I started rowing crew and then I did water polo for a little while. And then I, um, eventually ditched the competitive sport stuff and just started swimming for exercise which was weird right because I would get in the pool and it felt like very lazy to not do a workout that was on the clock 
Um, <laughs> and again, like to then understand that swimming for an hour without just like a whole like bunch of sets, you know, on, on the on times. And that was um, that finding satisfaction from just being in the water and swimming and how good that felt. Um, that was great. And, and then once I um, graduated, I um, started doing some open water swimming and I did a few, you know, triathlons and then, um, uh, you know, started surfing. And so I think actually surfing also helped me to appreciate swimming just for how good it feels while you're doing it. It's in the moment. You're very attuned to the, feeling the sensory reality of everything um and it's meditative you know i think that that's a very healing thing especially now that we're so um, everything is so mediated by screens and technology all this connection happens that way to have some part even before the pandemic that that have part some part of your day that's not that mm -hmm. um that's not has nothing to do with interfacing in this way that has to do with just something that's like you go and you drop into the water and you're clean, you're away from all of that. Um, and that is really good discipline, I think for disconnecting. And I, and actually this book sprang from an essay I wrote for the New York times. That was about that. It was about swimming being the last refuge from connectivity. And so that aspect of the, of swimming did make it into the, last section of the book because I really felt like it was something that has continued to be a timely and important thing to remind people that this is a really easy way I mean in the summer more so right now but that that mm -hmm. um but even like taking a shower or like getting in the bath or you know just to take a walk by the ocean um yeah that's uh in in the psychologists um, describe it as soft fascination. And I love that term because it's like when, when your attention is um, captured by something like, um, usually it's something in nature, you know, some kind mm -hmm. of observation in nature that is compelling enough, but not so tightly drawing your attention to it that you can't have your own, that some other part of your brain isn't having its own thoughts or kind of drifting in some way. And I think water, of course, really does that to you, especially if you are in it when you're yeah. um, you know, experiencing that. And that's so good for your brain. Um, and, and to know, again, like digging into the science behind all this stuff that, um, that our brains love water, that the alpha wave activity, which is the creative, relaxed, you know, um, that, 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 that rises, um, significantly when you're in and around water. I mean, that's, um, it's a really nice, it's nice that the science backs up all of these things that we kind of intuitively felt to be true for so long. So you mentioned, Bonnie, um, since you mentioned this, I'll ask it now, surfing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you surf daily? Like, when did you start that? And I also understand you have a new, a forthcoming uh, book out about surfing. Can you talk I a little do. bit? Um, I started surfing about um, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, but then with two kids in, in there. <laughs> so it kind of, it was not like a consistent, you know, building practice. It was kind of like this, and then it went like this, and like this. Uh, you can't really paddle with the, with the big belly. Um, I, and, and in the last year, in this pandemic year, I've been surfing nearly every day, which has been wonderful. Um, the beaches never shut here, and so it was really um, uh, amazing to to get to have that relationship with the ocean early in the morning. So I would go like when it was still dark to the beach, and um, I oh so the children's book yeah so it's my first children's book. It's called Sarah and the Big Wave, and it comes out in. Um, May and I and that sprang from I've always wanted to write a children's book but I I it sprang from this uh, cover story I did for California Sunday magazine about the big wave women surfers of, of Mavericks you know mm -hmm. this big um, very iconic big wave here in Northern California and how it had the there had been this surf competition there for years that always um, 
that never invited women. And so mm-hmm. there have been in, in, in recent years, of course, agitation for that to change. And so finally, oh, thank you. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> she just threw that into the chat. <laughs> um, but I love that story. I love talking to the surfers about um, their preparation for this, um, comp- the first competition that was going to include women. And then it didn't happen that year. And then the whole, the whole Mavericks contest thing changed. There was this whole drama that's too complicated and silly to get into right now. But um, suffice it to say that women's big wave surfing has exploded. Mm-hmm. And this year, this winter actually has been a huge year um, for winter swell already here in Northern California. And the the women have been charging out there with the men. And wow. it's been amazing to see. And so like I will... I will um, there have been just incredible videos and um, uh, photographs from Mavericks in the last month or two. And also this past year was the um, Maya Gabera surfed the biggest wave um, of any person surfed this year, man or woman. And so she, uh, so this story, this, this um, kids book came out because of that Cal Sunday story, but all these things have happened such that it's even more timely. And so this book is about um, Sarah Gerhardt, who was the first woman to surf Mavericks back in um, the late 90s. And and then in the back, there's some, um, like a timeline of, of milestones in uh, women's surfing that includes Maya Gabera's big, 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 big wave, which was um, at Nazare in Portugal, which is just insane. Like the year-end photography um, in the Times included this uh, shot of her surfing like a 70 two foot wave wow which is just you don't really you can't your brain can't fathom it until you see the person on the wave and it's just unreal um so yeah so that's what the book is about and i'm so excited um to uh to introduce that in may it's just going to be so fun we're doing i already know that we're doing a bunch of events and like the san francisco public school system um and we're doing uh they're sending books to all the kids at home and we're going to do an event where we read and I'm just really excited about that. Oh, that's great. Um, so do you prefer swimming or surfing? Still? Now? Um, <laughs> that's really hard to say. I, I think I just have days where I want to do one. Um, I want to do one or the other every day, but of course, different days I have in a different mood. <laughs> I mean, surfing is really fun. Like surfing is fun, but it's also terrifying sometimes. And it's also much more demanding of, of my, you know, for the reasons that we described with open water, that it's, it's more demanding of body awareness and safety. And um, there's a lot of other people to watch out for these days um, out in mm-hmm. the water, which is partly why I go out so early, so, so early. Um, and I, um, I just wrote a piece um, an essay about that period of time, which is called Civil Twilight, which is when the sun is six degrees below the horizon. Um, and then between that and dawn is this period called Civil Twilight. So it's it can happen in the morning. It's also called Twilight, Civil Twilight. And then the period at the end of the day is, is after the sun sets and then six degrees below the horizon. And in that period of time is this, this the time that I've had this relationship with the water and I wrote this essay for Outside Magazine that will be coming out in the next couple of days that really honors that time as the time that um, I think is a really special one, not with the, not just with the ocean, but with the other people around me. And I think mm-hmm. uh, there's a really nice term also for the beginning of that period of time. It's called civil dawn. And I'm like, I really like the way that that sounds. It sounds yeah. like you're respectful and you are... Um, you know, you are uh, conscious of the, the world around you. And I, and I like that so much. Again, like because of the words, I like the way that they, what the sort of meanings that they hold in them. And so it's not just the experience of doing it, but, but telling the story about them that I really love. So since, um, since completing the book, Why We Swim, have you heard from any of the folks who you've interviewed? Um, where oh, are they yeah. now? Um, so Gunnlaugur Fred Thorsen, who is the Icelandic fisherman whose survival story opens the book, um, 
it is still in Iceland, you know, they survived lockdown and are, you know, they did, Iceland did a really amazing job with the coronavirus. <laughs> and I was very happy to hear that um, for him and his family. Um, um, Kim Chambers, who swam, um, she was a swimmer here who swam from the Farallons to San Francisco. Um, she is, has also been swimming through the pandemic, open water swimming, kind of staying healthy. Uh, gosh, who else? Um, the Baghdad swim team, uh, mm -hmm. Coach Jay, he's he's actually building, he's in, he's in Maryland, in Annapolis, and he's building this little surf, baby surfboard for my sons. Oh, He got this little wood, uh, uh, he got a bunch of wood. It's a, it's a wooden one, which is really cool. And he keeps sending me photos of this baby That's surfboard that he's building for them, which is just, I mean, you know, it's like, I can't think of a more perfect, wonderful thing. Um, and then, you know, everyone else, uh, I mean, everyone else I've been in touch with um, through the course of the, of the book, it's been really nice to kind of see um, also that this book kind of has shared their stories around the world. It's doing its own thing. Mm -hmm you know, independent of me. So um, how do you, how do you feel like the book though resonates? Are there any themes beyond swimmers? I mean, not certainly swimmers. I, as a swimmer, I was just like, wow, this is great. I read it from, you know, it was like a one day, two day read for me. But if you're not a swimmer, are there any themes that you're hoping readers can resonate with? Yeah. So it was really important to me to write a book that was not just for people who call themselves swimmers, right? So I wanted a book that was, um, that stood uh, as a good story, like a good, um, uh, a book that would tell us something about our human nature and our relationship with water that's universal. And so I, not just, again, for like people who are like instinctively, yes, I love swimming, but people who are like, I hate swimming, and and want to know why and or like I'm afraid of it and so I, fear is a huge uh, theme in the book that I um, confront and probe at because I I understand how powerful it is and I understand how um, much of a big deal it is for someone to to overcome that fear especially as an adult after having suffered like a trauma from you know in some past um, part of their lives that they don't actually feel comfortable or okay or um, uh, otherwise are leery of the water even though they you know will say like I I think it's beautiful I wish I were a better swimmer I would love to do that um, and interrogate that and so I, I it was important to, to me to um, probe at that porousness between states as I call it in the book and it has been so gratifying to me then since the book came out to get these letters from people who've said, I have started open water swimming because of this book, which I did not. That was not something that I was like expected to happen, uh, that this would be a call to arms for that. Cause I, you know, that wasn't my intent at all, but it's wonderful that they have read the book and gotten, um, something from it that reminded them of what they missed or what they wished that they could access or appreciate um, about the water. And so that has been beautiful, amazing, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a writer, you want to be able to reach a very wide swath of readers who may not be starting anywhere near where you are um, and and actually it is the biggest compliment when someone writes to me and says um, I didn't think I was going to like this book but I really liked it or uh, I didn't think there was going to be anything in this book that I didn't already know or you know stuff like that and yeah. I never take uh, uh, insult from that I think that's awesome <laughs> so um What's on the horizon now? I mean, I know that you have a forthcoming uh, the children's book out in May, and then you'll be doing events with that. Um, what are you? What else? What else are you writing and working on? I just finished a. Um, I just finished a story for Scribd. Um, so, uh, Scribd um, is this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, a 
basically a subscription um, a service that you can read anything like books, magazines, newspapers. And they have started commissioning um, uh, original stories, sort of somewhere between a magazine story and a book. And I just finished a story um, called The Uncertain Sea that's going to come out in March. Actually, um, Scribd just published a story by Charles Yu um, that just came out, uh, I think it was last week. Um, I think it's called The Last Girl on Earth, I think. Uh, don't hold me to that, but you should look that up. Um, there's an excerpt, I think, in Entertainment Weekly that ran, and he's been doing some interviews. But that was a... Um, that just came out and so I've been working for the last several months on that story and I'm excited about that and it is an ocean story it's a shark story it's a story oh, wow. about um, the last sea urchin diver um, in the Farallons <laughs> and um, who became this this guy named Ron Elliott who became um, uh, this basically the premier underwater photographer and filmmaker of the Farallon Islands here. Um, and so he's, you know, his chief shot footage for um, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, mm. um, Cal Academy of Sciences. Um, and he just, you know, the Farallons are where the, you know, large numbers of great white sharks come every winter to um, feed. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of seals mm -hmm. that they, you know, they a juvenile, um, you know, elephant seal can feed them feed a shark for or sustain a shark for a month so they come and they hang out there and he goes and he films them and so it's about how he did that for 30 years or he spent time you know diving with the sharks for 30 years and um never really got into trouble until he did and he got bit uh, a couple mm. years ago um and almost lost his right hand and forearm and, and survived um and then went back why did he go back? And it was, it's this larger story about fear and risk and resilience and kind of, um, I wanted to write this story because it was my way of coping with all of the uncertainty and mm -hmm. fear and just craziness that was this last year, you know, the pandemic and then also the political unrest um, and just not knowing what's going to happen. Um, and so I think that this was all a metaphor for that and I wanted to know how someone who voluntarily goes into the places that people are the most afraid of goes back after this tra traumatic event. Um, so I felt like there was something to be uncovered there and to be investigated. And I really loved writing it. I was, I'm very proud of that story. Oh, I can't wait to, I can't wait to read that one. Exciting. And before we start taking questions um, from our audience out there, and so excited to see so many out there, um, final question is, how did you decide to, um, on the ending? I, I really I really love that, you know, you ended with yourself and also with the swim at Lake George, which felt more like a ritual. Is uh -huh, a ritual? Yeah. Can you talk a bit about, yeah, how you decided upon using that as an ending? Um, well, so, it just, I think in the section of the, so the last section of the book is called Flow, and it's a departure from the previous four sections of the book in that there's no, I guess you could say there's no anchoring character or story the same way that survival, well-being, community, and competition had, right? These like characters that are known or not so known but have very vivid um, um stories to tell that it was more meditative that it was more literary that it was taking inspiration mm -hmm. from specific swims that i had and is again more internal because it's about um what we seek from swimming that is um the mental psychological emotional benefits but also that literary landscape that um, swimming does occupy it has occupied for centuries, right? So for millennia, really. And so that was kind of fun. But also I remember writing that, when I started writing that section, I thought, is this going to work? Because, you know, you had these like ripping yarns in the first four sections, and then you're kind of like in this place that's more meditative. And, I, and actually, um, I'm happy to, I'm happy that people, many people actually said that was the, their favorite part of the book because I think that it was relatable. And I think I, what I, I sort of co coming back to the scene that I had in, in the beginning um, of wanting it to be 
you know, every, I'm the every man swimmer. And so the stories that I tell um, at the sort of in the flow section are things that are supposed to be things that you, that everyone can understand um, whether or not they are swimmers. Like it's about our human condition. Mm -hmm. It's about our internal lives. It's about swimming through difficult things um, and, and, and different difficult periods in my life. Again, like um, through, you know, miscarriage, my parents' divorce, um, like deaths of, of people I love, um, injury, and, and, and then come out on the other side of that. Like swimming has always helped me through a difficult time. And so uh, that's, and again, like water is healing. So it's also investigating these, um, what we have always, uh, how we have culturally held water and immersion and buoyancy and flow and all these things in our cultural, um, historical context, like in our tradition. So I think that's, um, the tradition of swimming across Lake George, you know, I swam across the, the lake with my husband on our wedding day and then like 40 of our closest friends and relatives and, and, and back and, and then having that ritual kind of go on for many years, um, even after we moved to California that we did that and what that meant, you know, and like the swimmer by swimmer connection. And, and then of course, at the end of the book to see my sons yeah, um, learning to swim and loving the water and giving their bodies over with abandon, you know, and me as a mother watching them being terrified <laughs> at the same time that, 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 but that mirrors like the opening of the book when I'm at Jones beach. And I remember being yeah. like a little kid and almost drowning there. And so it, really um um was very meaningful to write through all of those things and so it felt like the right way to end the book as a as a continuing thing right a thing that continues well i i enjoyed the book incredibly and i look forward to reading your uh, your next book on surfing and maybe i'll be brave enough to try my second lesson on surfing <laughs> beat up on my first lesson out there in California but we have um I want to allow ample time for questions because we have a, a lot of questions I think in the chat box and I'm really excited to see so many folks here this evening um I'm going to start taking some questions so um uh one question Bonnie that's coming up is about how did you overcome how did you overcome writer's block? Is that is if that if that happened along the way? And Angdo says, thank you for this rare window into your experience behind the book. And that is her question. Thank you. Um, I uh, I would definitely say that there were I wouldn't say that I had writer's block exactly in the writing of this book. I would say that there were times when it was more difficult to get myself to write. And then in those times I would go swimming and tell myself that I was doing research for the book. <laughs> but you know, that usually like jogged things loose and took me out of my head. So that actually worked pretty well. Um, it's nice to have like a sort of built in, uh, activity for, um, combating that. And, and, you know, it has worked pretty well. Um, I recommend it. <laughs> Another question, one from uh, Marie Cole. Did you ever stop swimming for some time? And if you did, what, what brought you back to swimming? Um, I think the only time of any consequence that I didn't swim fairly regularly was in the first couple of years of college, just I, again, because I was trying different things. Um, other than that, I would say that I swam, I've, I've swum pretty regularly in some way, like finding some pool somewhere. Um, when I lived in New York, um, I would find, I mean, it was hard to swim in the winter. Um, you just, there weren't that many pools that you could swim in the winter, but um, I would swim a lot in the summers. I swam at a pool called Hamilton Fish down on the Lower mm. East Side. I love that pool. Or at Riverbank State Park, right? So I swam there. Um, and uh, and then would travel a lot and, and went swimming. Um, but I think that was sort of early college was probably the time that I didn't swim very much. Um, and then again, I, I had novelty to kind of, and I was burned out from competition like club swimming, um, but, but, but then I kind of came back to it, obviously. <laughs> 
So when, when we can travel, and you know, when you can travel again, what swimming location is at the top of your list to uh, visit or swimming locations? Oh, that's such a good question. So many. Um, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to go to Costa Rica like in two weeks for oh. vacation. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Uh, so I would love to go there again. Um, my brother-in-law's wedding has been postponed, was postponed from last um, yeah. summer in Hawaii. Um, and it's rescheduled for the summer in Hawaii and some of the big island. Fingers crossed that we'll all get there. And that will probably be the dreamy, dreamy place that I um, will go swim again. Uh, sort of through after this next phase of things is, is what I'm looking forward to. I think it's really important to have things to look forward to. I don't know about all you. I think I, it's just to have it sort of sitting over there in the horizon is really helpful. Yeah, so true, especially during this time. Another uh, comment, actually, and comment and question. Um, this is from uh, Moon Chi. So she's uh, not a swimmer here at all, got really interested in the book by the Icelandic guy story. <laughs> and her own personal story. Um, your book really helped me get through November, and I've been telling everyone about the book. So, a question about writing books um, How do you know when a story is a book? good question and and you mentioned you read a few you read a few books when you're working on this so do you have any suggestions yeah. yes um actually let me look at my shelves so many books here um i you know a book that i read that i really liked when i was working on this book was susan orleans the library book so i just loved how i love her writing i mean i've been a long time fan of hers but i also love how um you know, the, 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 the LA public library is the character, you know, the main character, mm -hmm. which is so cool. And then there are all these supporting characters, but the, how to bring like an institution to life. And of course it was also about her relationship with the library and bringing her son there and all that. Um, so I loved reading that book, um, as just a model for how to animate nonfiction, animate a story about a place. Um, of course there were like cool and very dramatic stories around the fire and the library um, and all that but to um, you know she's like she's anything you read by her I think is a master class in all these different facets of journalism and how to um, surprise the reader I, I told her that once I, I had the great pleasure to meet her and, um, at an event we were doing together and I said I look for, I always told her, um, I told her that I looked forward to all of her stories when they would come out in the New Yorker because I look forward to being surprised and I really like how she does that. Um, when a book, when, when a story is a book, I think that um, if you've been thinking about it for a long time and you keep kind of going away from it and coming back and going away from it and coming back over a period of a, a year or two, I think you really do want to, it, you really do want it to be a book. Whether or not it will become a book is a separate question, but I think that over time, if a, if, if a topic and a story, hopefully it's both, holds your interest enough that you keep thinking about it, even when you don't have to think about it, when it's not work, to me, that is the, you know, that's when I know that it, it wants to be something bigger, you know. And also when people, when you have conversations with people about, are you, are you talking about it? Are you telling people about these cool things that you've been thinking about or just because you're curious about it, not necessarily because you know that it's going to become a book. I think that's always a really good sign. Mm, excellent question from uh, coming in from Liz, what kind of epiphany have you had during the pandemic regarding swimming? Um, I will never take it for granted again. <laughs> I just, um, I mean, there's so many things I will never take for granted again after the pandemic. I, I, at least I don't think I will, I will remind myself to not do that. Um, it's like human contact <laughs> community. I really miss the community around the pool. So one of the things I really miss is, um, the locker room. So the mm -hmm. locker room at the pool that I swim at is, it's, I, I always would go at a certain time of day, like eight o'clock in the morning after I got the kids off to school 
And I would see the same people over and over and over again. And it wasn't necessarily that we'd have these like big deep conversations, but it was just the, the this tiny little locker room where we were sort of cramped together, but we would dip in any out of each other's lives. And I got to be great friends with some of those people, but other people I would just see every day and just to have, you know, maybe knew their names, but always knew their routines and their faces. And we would smile at each other just to have that on the multiple levels of interaction you have um, is a great comfort. It's a great um, structure for your day. And when you don't have that, you're just like, I, you don't know how much it means until it's gone. And so I had, I had had reason to appreciate it when I was writing the book, because I thought about many facets of my relationship with the pool and the community and the young people and all that. Um, but I really, 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 really miss them when the pool closed. It was very, and even now, you know, it's, it's definitely not the same. I don't see those people. I, we have to be outside the whole time. We're lined up. We have our masks on. So we don't really, um, it's not at all the same. You're not like this far away from each other, naked, you know, in the locker room. Um, but I did this morning, maybe four, no, maybe six of the nine lanes that were occupied this morning were people I knew. And I thought it felt very lively because six people I knew were all together in a, in a, in the open water in the, in the outdoor pool deck. So that felt extremely exciting. I remember there was a woman who got out of the pool and she said, it feels so festive this morning. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I miss that. I, and I think we all have those moments of our days that we really miss, whether it's like greeting the bus driver that you see every morning or, um, you know, the person you get your coffee from. I just, um, those little interactions, I think, matter a lot more than we realize. That was a great question. I see in our chat box, Marie says, I miss breakfast Eve after practice with my teammates. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. It's in locker room banter as well. So um, another question from Michelle. What advice, Bonnie, do you have for writers who are trying to fit writing into their lives when they have a full-time job? Um, and also, once again, dealing with writer's block. Yeah, I have thoughts about that for sure. Um, I would say like in the morning, I know it hurts to get up early in the morning, but when I was um, running short on time to finish this book, I would get up at five and write between five and seven. And those were the most um, wonderful, quiet, um, uh, productive hours. Like I would even like at one hour, you know, between five to six or six to seven, um, I would get the best writing of the day done then. Um, then I would, get from you know one to four in the afternoon um so and when i had a full-time job and um uh, many years ago and was right trying to write a book i did it yeah in the mornings like in the off in the time that i would be off work um, but really the mornings i wasn't a morning person then but now i am so i'm definitely pushing for the early morning um, rather than staying up late at night, just cause, unless you function really well then, but I don't now, I just, am so tired. I just, I can't, I'm fried by three thirty, <laughs> you know? So, um, but I do find that morning time so precious and it's like this first thing, very clean blank slate time. That's yours. Excellent. Um, oh, we have somebody inviting you to a swim in La Jolla Cove. As well. Oh, I, you know what? I, I was, I had on my book tour an event there and, and was so looking forward to swimming at La Jolla Cove. So I will, after all of this, <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. We have a question from Robert. I think taking the measure of competition out of swimming um, does swimming help in exploring the immersion in our element of water? I think you touched a little bit upon that, but that's the question. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Taking the measure of competition out of swimming, does swimming help in exploring the immersion in our element water? Yes. I think, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure I understand, uh, I'm, I'm understanding him right, but I, if, if, does swimming help us to understand our relationship with water? Yeah. 
And yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think going under the water, I, I just think about like every age, like babies to, um, you know, the seniors at the pool who like on their way out of the pool, like diving in the lanes and are doing their little flips. And I'm like, I never see that. Like they're playing, like they're playing. I never see these guys doing this outside of the water, but that you see a different personality of someone in the water that manifests in this um, like very instinctive way. I just, you know, people cannonball, people dive, people do flips and stuff for no reason other than it's fun. And I think that um, that is something that's very essential to us as grownups um, when we don't have necessarily have that on a, on in or other we don't give ourselves permission or to do that in other places and water is one of those things that just kind of coaxes it out very easily i think so um are there any hand i should have actually said this earlier but you can raise your hands too uh if are there is there are there any other questions um does anybody want to raise their hand in uh function if you can or place the questions in the chat box um i was going to ask you bonnie so your your children also swim and surf it's sounding like as well are they getting um, they don't surf yet well my older son who's 10 has surfed um before and he loves body surfing loves body surfing um but yeah they're swimmers they're on the swim team um they've been able to go back to practice a couple times a week which has been amazing um and so they are swimming again and i see such a difference in how they are to be able to get exercise and just you know i watch them play in the water and it's it's great it's amazing so Delver, uh, thanks, thanks you for talking with us. And he said the book was definitely one of the highlights of his pandemic life this winter. Oh, thank you. He's a student. I'm a student journalist, and I was wondering if you can say more about the uh, process of writing your book and figuring out its structure. Back to the structure. Did you have certain characters, stories, or themes in mind before starting, and did you, or did you just start researching and reporting to see what you could find as well? Right. So I, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had just started collecting these um, stories I had found. I just had a folder like on my computer that I would just throw things into or notes um, or like interesting links to, th you know, things that I had read. Um, and uh, over time, it kind of became clear to me which ones were, um, you know, I would do a bunch of interviews um, and things kind of rose to the top. And so over time, I, I, I thought that those were, um, I knew which stories I really wanted to pursue. And uh, so when I wrote the book proposal, when I finally decided to write the book proposal, and then that went out, I think it was now 2017 was when I sold the book, um, and then wrote it probably over the next 15 months, I think. I think that's right. I think I have the timing right. Um, and um, I feel like the writing itself was relatively quick and easy. It, I had a blueprint from my proposal that actually I had spoken to. Um, I spoke to a um, a journal, a nonfiction writing class, um, not too long ago, and I looked at my proposal and I. Um, because I wanted to talk to the students about it. And I realized that the opening of the proposal was almost exactly like the opening for the book. So I knew it, it survived pretty intact from the proposal to the opening pages of the proposal to the opening pages of the book, which meant that at that point in time, I knew that I had a pretty strong story that I wanted to pull people in with, which was the story of the Icelandic fisherman. And now, at the time that I sold the proposal, I did not know if that Icelandic fisherman would ever talk to me <laughs> because he was famously a recluse and didn't like journalists after many years of interacting with them. So um, I had to kind of go out on a limb in that I would figure out either how to find him and convince him to talk to me 
or I would report around his story and the significance of his story to Iceland Icelanders as a cult, uh, you know, at large as a country and and the past and the history um, that that I could make it work. So I definitely there were absolutely unknowns when I wrote the proposal, but much of it was in place. You know, I had the sections of the book, you know, parsed out, and I had ideas about what those sections would include. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, really, it's it's about, I think, um, figuring out, figuring out the structure has a lot to do with understanding if the book is going to stand up to, you know, a couple of years of reporting and writing, because you really do need to map out um, what you're going to do. So Bonnie, here's a good question uh, about the cover mm -hmm. of the book, which I, I really love. Um, how did you pick the art and the design for the book cover? Oh, I didn't pick it. <laughs> Algonquin, uh, well, they had this beautiful, this amazing book designer um, came up with this design and I just loved it. But Jason Heuer, Heuer is the designer. Um, and I just loved, I mean, I will, I will say this and then with the caveat of which is that the, my previous book cover, I'm from American Chinatown, I did not like it, did not like it. I had a lot of thoughts about it that I will say for some off camera <laughs> day we can all discuss, but um, this was like, this was, I love it so much. It, it really represents to me the book um, and uh, it's beautiful. So I was really happy with it, but they, you know, if they of course ran it, Algonquin um, ran it by me for um, approval and all that. But I, it was easy because I loved it. So Bonnie, we have a question from Robert McLean. Does Robert want to ask, to get on the camera and ask the question? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> is that Robert? Robert, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Robert, I think you have to unmute yourself. You'll have to unmute. Oh, oh, oh. he says he's trying. Uh, oh, well, you know, I can read. There, the I got it now. You, you, it. you just changed it. Okay, great. Hi, Bonnie. Uh, Hi, and and uh, Amy and everyone who's made this possible. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is beautiful stuff. Um, basically, yeah, my question was kind of long, but going back to that sense of what a drummer who I know calls uh, entrainment, uh, the word does exist, I think now in the dictionary, but when the effects I have from swimming in which you so aptly describe are this, this sense of playfulness and, and which Wallace Nichols, which I know you know of, and he's, mm -hmm. he's touted your work, uh, describes us that uh, the sense of awe that we enter, the sense of connectedness and all that crap and that what we call red mind just you know goes away. And my question to you is that I, I definitely am turned on by your work through this. I knew I was going to get your book, but your personal views on how swimming has helped you to elicit this wonder that you get, this high you get from swimming, and how that reverberates or impacts in positive changes for others, and particularly with regards to we this little tiny planet we live on that Carl Sagan's been talking about forever. <laughs> And how you know conservation organizations tend to alert us through the doom and gloom scenario versus the connection and that that wonder, and um, how that can help us help others. You know, um, I was really pleased and a little bit surprised when um, uh, the book was selected for a climate reads event from the Brooklyn Public Library um, what was it last month, and um, not not. Not because um, I don't talk about, you know, the, what you just mentioned, which is our relationship with our environment and climate change and, um, you know, all the interconnectedness of all this stuff. Um, the, but that there are so many other books that are more explicitly about the climate crisis and how to t tackle it in a more like practical kind of ways. But to your point, um, I think that um, having a firsthand relationship with that environment 
that is very personal is, is something that is extremely effective with um, uh, getting people to understand the impacts that, that you know we as a species have on this planet and what we what needs to be done in order to mitigate that and and to um, get people to care you know I think stories really do that uh, we already know much more um, that that personal stories about like one or two people or things that hit very specifically on the individual level in a, in a kind of like me you level um, are more effective at cha you know kind of ch getting people to do things you know motivating them to action than like these sort of larger abstract statistical huge numbers um, kinds of um, journalism that are so important because we need these for the record but in terms of like it's very easy for us psychologically as humans to kind of tune that out and not respond to them in a way that um, we need to which is to act and so um, I actually in this um, the story the shark story I was telling you about um, the uncertainty that I wrote for script I talk a, I talk a lot about that because I, I think a lot I had thought a lot I had been thinking a lot about the question of you know these the the outsized impacts that we have had on this planet from like it's all about um, you know the near term satisfaction of what we want versus the sort of what will happen you know if you eliminate all of the sharks through you know poaching for you know for the next two years you know that you're like I want to use um, actually this is a very interesting fact I came across which is that you know, mm -hmm. squalene is this, it's a substance that, um, mm -hmm. is from mm -hmm. shark liver that is used in a lot of vaccines and a bunch of the vaccines that are, that are under development use this. Mm -hmm. Um, and should any of them prove to be effective, it could impact the shark populations, to the tune of, you know, many, many millions of sharks being killed on top of the hundred million that are killed every year. Um, and, and the shark's home, the ocean, as it, as it affects climate and phytoplankton, exactly, right. so which absorbs like, carbon, so. Right, and so um, it is, it's such a, uh, it's such a puzzle because we are, we are such a weird <laughs> species and we have very interesting um, ways of thinking about things. And again, like in, in investigating our, how we, uh, how we assess risk and how we, how fear, our fear response causes us to, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, you know, just how that has reverberations across, you know, all ecosystems and around our planet, like depending on what it is that you are talking about, like you can really, it's like your mind just goes into a pretzel, but it's fascinating stuff. And so I really do think that, um, uh, you know, telling these stories. I mean, like, you know, parable of the sower, like just that, 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 it, you know, shot to the top of the <laughs> New York times bestseller list, you know, so many years after the fact, because we are, we are looking for ways to understand what is happening and what we're doing. So, um, I think stories really, uh, um, have a lot of power. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you all. So time flies. I realize that we only have a few more, a few more minutes here. Um, Bonnie, do you have any final, final words tonight for our, uh, our audience of writers? Um, just to say thank you. Summer. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Amy, for doing this with me. Um, thank you, Liz, for inviting me. Thank you so much um, to the book club for having me. I'm just like really delighted to be able to do this and um, appreciative of your support for Wiley Swim and me. So I'm so excited um, about your forthcoming book. Again, it's Sarah and the Big Wave coming out in May. And also Why We Swim is published by Algonquin Books. And I'm um, really excited, Bonnie. This was, this was a, a treat for me. And I'll hopefully under normal times, I'll be coming out and swimming in the open water again. Yes, look me up. <laughs> And, and, and back in the locker room again as well. Um, so thank you again for everybody's time and thanks for joining us. And um, thank you to AAJ New York and the entire team there for making this possible. 
And um, I think Bonnie also has a newsletter as well. And like I mentioned the titles earlier, you can, you can search for those. Those are in the chat box also as well. So thank you everybody and I hope everybody has a good evening. Liz, do you have any final words? Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Bonnie, for this amazing discussion about why we swim and Sarah and the big wave. Um, I love that you're able to talk not just personally, but about the book, which is itself personal and universal about this most human interaction with nature. Uh, thank you, Amy, for moderating. And we look forward to the May Book Club for your From Farms to Incubators. Uh, I also want to thank Heather Chin, our New York Chapter Vice President, who's behind the scenes. <laughs> Uh, doing our wizard, being our Wizard of Oz at the Zoom controls, and uh, Diamond Nagazio, our chapter secretary, who's on um, part of the book club committee. Thank you all for attending, and um, good night. Okay, um, there's still a few people left over. So I'm just gonna end the end it now. Sounds good. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>